Our presenter for this session is Christopher Phillips. Christopher Phillips is the Campus Accessibility Specialist. As the Electronic Information Technology Accessibility Coordinator, I just joked with him that he must need fold out business cards to fit his title on. But as the Electronic and Information Technology Accessibility Coordinator at Utah State University, Christopher is available to help you make sure your course is, is, as accessible, is accessible to every student in your classroom. With experience in instructional design, special education, and web development, he works to make, sure our, cam he works to make our campus more accessible for everyone. If you're an expert teacher or just getting started, feel free to reach out to Christopher at accessibility at usu.edu uh, to talk with him about making your instruction more accessible to everyone. Please welcome Christopher. Christopher. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to talk about making your classroom accessible to as many students as possible. So, um, and, and we will talk specifically about accessibility for students with disabilities. But as we talk about accessibility, we'll also kind of look, of look at things that you can do that'll make your classroom just more accessible and more usable to all students. So whether you call it accessibility, uh, universal design, or just good design, there's a lot of these things that you can do that are just going to make you a better teacher in the classroom. A couple of just numbers to be aware of as we get started on this that will help hopefully help you feel good about being here. There, there is a Disability Resource Center on campus where students with disabilities can register if they have a disability and need accommodations. Not all students with disabilities do, but, but many of them do. Last year there were just over 1,700 students um, who, had a, who registered with the Disability Resource, Resource Center to be able to get the accommodations that they need. And so that's a, a pretty big number, and you're likely to see some of these students in your classrooms. A general statistic that's often used is about 11% about of students are going to, have, going to have some possibility. Not all of them will register or let you know about that, or you won't even be aware of it. But, but, it's, a, but it's a lot of students that, you, that um, this is going to impact and be um, just will, that it will affect. One of the goals as we talk today as well is we'll learn some practical tips and some things that you can kind of learn and do, but, but also just to kind of understand a little bit better what the experience perspective of a student with a disability might be. If we talk about disability, it can be any number of um, broad general categories, and it's going to be any student with a disability is going to have their own unique experience. Uh, you know, we're talking about students maybe who are low vision or blind, um, or maybe a student who's hard of hearing or deaf, deaf students with disabilities, um, significant mental health challenges, all of these different things can affect learning in the classroom in one way or the other. As we talk about accessibility, there's a couple of reasons why um, you may be interested in it. One of them is just the legal issues around accessibility. Increasingly, there are laws out there that, that require that every student, uh, whether they have a disability or not, have access, access to the meals and those in the environments in, in your classroom. And increasingly, we're seeing higher education um, being held accountable, lawsuits kind of popping up all over the country um, where institutions of higher learning have, have failed to meet that challenge and are not being accessible enough. And so it's something, certainly something we're very aware of here at Utah, Utah State. There's currently a task force in place to get kind of an accessibility policy and make sure the support supports and resources are available to you. This is things like uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, Section 504, laws like that that just require us to care about this. But, but the better reason, I think, um, the Declaration of Independence here on this slide, but it's just this idea that don't be a jerk, right? I mean, be a good person. We, we want to help other people. We, we, wanna, we, wanna, we want every student in our classroom, I think in general, to, to have a good experience and to not have to um, ask for special accommodations or to uh, do anything differently than any other student. And if creating a course to be accessible from the get-go, then a student can walk into your classroom or log into your online course and just will have a good experience. And what, what a wonderful thing that is for them not to have to do anything, to do anything than any other student. In the, in the physical world, it's easy for us for generally to tell it when something is accessible or not. You can look at this curb cut and you can see a wheelchair there, and you can tell that's not accessible. It's going to be difficult for that um, person in a wheelchair to get fried walk down onto the street with that. Versus uh, a curb cut, where we can look at that, and we can see that's accessible. 
There's a wheelchair, the, they've cut that curb cut out, so it's really easy for someone to get from a, a sidewalk down onto the street. Now, with curb cuts, I'll just take a quick detour. One of the, the uh, curb cuts were required in, originally by the Americans with Disabilities Act, and there was a lot of moaning and complaining about this, this work we had, we had to do to make our sidewalks available. But one of the cool things about curb, curb cuts is, is how beneficial they've been to so many different uh, groups. Whether you're, you're you know, pushing a, a shopping cart, um, a stroller, luggage, skateboard, or bicycle, almost everybody uses curb cuts. Um, and, and this is a great thing I think we'll see as we kind of go throughout the presentation today, is these accessibility uh, things that we'll talk about are also going to have an effect and make your classroom just more accessible for all of your students. Okay, and so we talked a little bit about being able to tell the difference between something that's accessible or not accessible in the real world. How do we do, how do, we do that in an online course, though? What, what, what does disability look like? Um, student who logs into Canvas. What are those curb cuts, uh, you might say, that would indicate that a course is accessible? One of the, the first things we'll look at, just a quick and easy one, just to get started, is, is color contrast. Um, and, and, and so the example here is uh, poor contrast. Now, now, this is big enough that you might be able to tell what that says still, but a lot of websites you'll go to or maybe the best example of this is if you're outside on a sunny day and you pull out your phone and you, and you read it, right? And you're squinting, and if the contrast isn't really strong, it's really hard to read that. Whoops. Um, versus good contrast where it's just, um, you can very easily tell the text from the background. And that's just something very, very quick and easy to do, but, but often is something that, that people get wrong. You know, you'll see a light gray, light gray on a slightly lighter gray background. Um, or somebody might get artistic and do something one way, but just be aware of, of contra contrast, how big of a deal it's going to make. It's going to make it completely unusable for some students, but if you have good contrast, it's going to be just more usable for everybody. Um, again, thinking of the example of a, of a cell phone on a sunny day um, is an example of that. Another one we're going to talk about just for a second is video captions. Now. I, I love talking about captions because there's so many advantages that come to using captions for everybody. Uh, here's a video with a, just a, a screenshot of a video with a, um, a caption, caption file laid on that. Now, if you're not able to access the audio of a video, then captions are obviously going to be essential, right? Because a video without the audio oftentimes is just going to be not effective at all. And so for a student who's deaf or hard of hearing, Captions are just going to be something that we, that we, just going to be required right off the bat. But I think to consider just for a moment um, all of the other uses of captions. I mean, even if we were just to real quick, maybe, if you ever turn on captions when watching television, maybe just a raise of hands real quick. So, so a lot of hands raised in the audience. And there's a lot of different reasons where captions are going to come in handy. It may be that... Uh, uh, you have a student who's learning English as a second language and is able to read a lot better than they're able to, able to hear what is being said. Uh, one of the most frequent uses of captions is in bars and restaurants, um, you know, where you have the TV up on the screen and, and, they, and, and they don't want to have the audio playing over the conversation, but you can still see what's going on. Uh, a, ma a movie or a show or a, a video clip where the, where the speaker is difficult, difficult and captions can again be super helpful there. Or maybe even just the audio is, is not going to be bad, it's not very good. This next slide, and I forgot to let our uh, helper know, are you, are you, are you on a link, link real quick in that presentation to jump out to a, a demo? One of the, th I want to show real quick a feature that's coming to, um, excuse me, our Canvas videos this fall. It's called Inter called Inter uh, Caption Captions. And the idea, the idea here for any video that is captioned, and maybe you've seen this if you've gone to TED.com, it's a really cool feature where you'll wa be watching a video. Uh, you'll click, click, yeah, go ahead and click on that link. Um, and this is, a, this is from one of our ETE presentations earlier this, um, earlier this uh, year. Um, and, and the caption file is actually displayed right there below the video. And so if you were to go, go ahead and press play, press play uh, sorry, I'm seeing it on my screen, but you're not seeing it on yours. Are we able to get that on the big screen there? Thank you so much. Oh, except we want to stay, 
uh, with the smaller screen on this one. You can minimize the video again. Uh, this is the first in a series of uh, statewide presentations. And you can see on there, because the, the video is captioned, that as the speaker speaks, every word that he has is, is highlighted, um, which can be useful for some types of learners to watch that. Uh, maybe go ahead and turn the audio down while we do that. But another great feature of this is that you're able to search through a, a, a lecture. So say you had a 60-minute lecture. And in this case, would you mind searching for, I remember somewhere in the middle of this, he talked about millions. So if you go ahead and type in millions into that search bar right there, um, then go ahead and click on that where it says there's millions of dollars right there. And the video will immediately start playing right there in that, that section of the video. video. Again, and this is something that because this video is captioned, this is just going to come out of the out of the and available to anybody to use for any of your videos in Canvas. Super helpful. Students can also quickly download the transcript if they want, um, and then they can take it on the go and read through it or use it for whatever reason they want to. Thank you so much. You can go ahead and pause that and maybe jump back to the presentation. So that's just one quick example of captions. Captions are to me just a no-brainer on your courses. If you have videos, if you use videos a lot in your courses. Um, I'll share an email at the end or talk to the instructional designer you work with. Work on getting them captioned and, and we're happy to help that. They just have so many uses in so many different scenarios. And then when you do have, do have a student deaf or hard of hearing in to come into your classroom, they'll be, they'll, you'll be set and ready to go and your videos will all be accessible already. Next one I want to look at just for a second is a consistent structure. And this is one that hopefully many of you are doing already to some degree because it's, it's just good practice in general. But we'll go through a quick example. Uh, let's say you're setting up a new course and your instructional designer gives you a, a quick, maybe this is just a ba very basic template, right? And they say, go, knock yourself out, add your content, do what you will. Um, but as an instructor, maybe you get to see, the, to see that you can change things in there if you want to, so you start playing around with it a little bit. Maybe even know just, know just enough email to, to get really creative and start um, rearranging things. And, and you want to have every module be different and, and, and to match your personality. And so you've got a, a very unique thing. But then what that can lead to is a type of, type of an experience for a student where from one week they'll log in and have and, and know, kind of see one type of course or experience. And the next week they might log in and see something completely different. Which can obviously be a, cha be a challenge. This is some type of more consistent experience. Uh, and not to say that everything has to be exactly the same or you can't be creative, but just to keep in mind, you know, for a student maybe with uh, attention issues or some learning disabilities, creating this kind of, kind of consistent structure can really be the difference between that student logging in and feeling safe and successful or feeling, feeling anxious, confused, and even abandoning the course or the assignment for that day. And so just, again, something to keep in mind, keeping your, your course experiences uh, consistent, distant, board. A big one for a lot of instructors as far as making your stuff usable is, uh, is your files. Uh, your Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, uh, Adobe, uh, your PDF files. Um, how many of you have, maybe it's in one of your courses or, or, or seen a course where you've downloaded a file and a PDF and it's kind of skiwampus and half dark and the text is, is half legible. Just not going to be usable for anybody, right? Uh, but especially not for someone who is blind in that case. It, it, certain PDF files, if they're not um, prepared the right way, there's absolutely no text that shows. It's just a great big image. But there's some really quick... Um, software we can run that through that makes takes all of the text even in those messed up files cleans it up, cleans it up a little and makes it available and usable to everybody um, and so and there's a lot of little things you can do in in, in any of those of those formats I want to look real quick I'm going to jump to another to another day. you could just click on that link for us about the importance of headings in a, just in a word and, and headings often are going to be whether it's a word document or a PowerPoint document um, Thank you so much. And so you can see here um, a document that's marked up, and there's, it shows that there are headings on the page, right? You have a, a top-level heading, a second-level heading, and then just some text in there. Um, and, the, and the key thing is here is when you're creating headings is to actually use heading styles in Microsoft Word. And many of you, again, might be using this already because there's a lot of advantages to doing so. Um, but, but as an example, this heading right here is actually a heading, but this one right here, all I did was made the text bigger. 
And if you make the text bigger, it looks like a heading, but it doesn't act like a heading to someone who is blind. Um, and it's going to make it a lot more difficult. Now, if you do add headings, other features it gives you, can you click on the tools button right there at the top? And then just click on, um, maybe it's format, I'm sorry. Outline, where did outline go? Try tools one more time. Anybody see outline? Document outline, thank you. I was looking for a no. Um, and, and so you can see that if it's marked up correctly with headings, it's a quick way that you or I visually might scan through a document by looking at the headings, the same way uh, someone, someone who's able to now scan through your document using those headings as well. You'll notice this one right here that actually isn't a heading doesn't show up on that. And that would be the experience of someone who is blind. If you're not using headings, it just wouldn't be as accessible. Thank you so much. Jump back into the presentation. Okay, so with all these accessibility, sometimes, um, and, and maybe it's a first day of class and you have somebody, somebody come, it can be overwhelming to consider all the things you might need to do in your classroom or in a course to make sure it's accessible. And we want to make sure that, that you know there's a lot of resources available and you don't need to become an expert in all things accessibility to be able to create an accessible classroom experience. Uh, but you do need to know who to reach out to and where to get help. And so I just want to share a couple of those resources that are available. The first one I mentioned briefly earlier is the Disability Resource Center. Um, David Pruden does a fantastic job over there. They're the, the group, and they're in the bottom of the University Inn. Anytime a student with a disability um, registers with their office, they then understand what accommodations are needed. And if that student registers for your classroom, they'll reach out to you um, toward the beginning of the semester or a little bit early and, and talk to you about anything that you might need to do and offer the support that's going to be needed to help you make sure your classroom is accessible. At the same time, if you have a student that you might have some questions about or you need some resources in meeting a unique learning need, just reach out to the, out to the Disability Resource Center and they're super anxious to help you with any type of need that exists that way. Uh, the other group I'll just mention, we're, we're super fortunate here at Utah State. WebAIM is one of the, the most trust, trusted ability organizations in the world, and they're right here on our, cam our campus. Um, some of you may have worked with them or seen them over in the Center for Persons with Disabilities. They have a fantastic website, a lot of resources. If you're ever interested in just learning more or becoming familiar with accessibility, they have, they have a great action to web accessibility kind of a module that they take you through. This is a tremendous resource, highly, highly recommended. And then I, then I, I uh, offer up uh, my contact information. Uh, part of the emphasis the university is putting on accessibility, I just came on, uh, came to campus just in the last year with a brand new position, uh, the title of Accessibility and in Information Technology. Sorry, I, I don't even get it all right all the time. Ex Electronic and Information Technology Accessibility Coordinator. But, but just is he I'm here to help with this kind of stuff and to help you be aware and, and whatever we can do to, to help out that way. And so if you just, um, even if you don't have a student with a disability that you know is coming, but you want to just talk about this or this, or what can I do to make sure my course is ready or prepared, I, I, I'd love to continue to have that conversation. Um, this, this, this is a really big deal, and it, make, and it makes such a, diff a difference to students. To walk into a classroom and to see that you've, that you've taken some of these, done some of these things already, or that you're willing to, it just, just creates a whole different um, feeling and, 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 and welcoming to the classroom. It can help those students have every success that any other student does. Um, as you make these efforts to, to make your courses accessible, more accessible, there's a lot of other advantages that come besides the accommodation feature. Those are important on their own. Um, but as we do this work to kind of design our courses in a way that they're accessible to students with disabilities, it really creates a course that is just more accessible to every single student. Um, every student obviously has different learning needs, different backgrounds, different experiences that they come to your classroom with. And looking at these needs and how we can support every single student is just going to make your classroom a much friendlier place for every student to be in and a better learning experience for every, everyone. So. Thank you so much. With that, I'll just ask if there's any questions anybody has about anything specifically on accessibility.
Perfect, yeah, the, the email, and there's a handout up here at the front, you're welcome to come grab that has some of this information. I'll also mention I have a booth out there that I'm happy to talk, but there's a captions at usu.edu. Just send an email to that, or you know, feel free to call me with your, with your course and what you'd like, and we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and take care of it. Yeah, so this is the idea of uh, somebody speaking in a computer, kind of hearing what they're, what they're saying. We see on TV for live show, shows, right. they have closed captions appearing really, really about a second or something like that. Yeah. I have no idea how it's done, but so, so I was wondering whether there is that's a possibility. soon be that kind of possibility for IBC collections. Good. Thank you. So the question is, um, for like an IVC video, what is the possibility of having live captions available to students to see? So right now, this is, there's a couple of answers to that question that is available. Most of the things you see on TV are done by a human stenographer, somebody who types really fast. Um, and, and that's available, those, 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 that's obvious an expensive service. There is some live captioning that can be done here at Utah State for classrooms. Some of you may have had that in a classroom even. Um, but generally that's not gonna be available to every, everyone just yet, but there are some really exciting things happening with machines being able to hear what you're saying and then caption those automatically. You'll see that sometimes on YouTube and it can still be, it's just not quite there yet, right? And an 80% captioning uh, accuracy sounds really high, but that's really one out of every five words that's wrong. And so maybe you've seen a YouTube video with automatic captions and it's just, doesn't, doesn't work quite right. But I think that's something that we will definitely see in the future and that's coming. And it's a, great, it's a great thing to have. I love watching almost any video with captions on wherever I can. It's just a great way to, to keep track of what's going on with the conversation. Good question. Please. Good. Yeah, and for a student with something like autism, um, on the on, on autism spectrum, that's going to be um, um, so unique to what that student is, is going to be. And so I think generally what you would look at there would be what are that student's specific learning needs. And in, and in that case, it might be that the, the consistent structure might be a really big deal to that student. Um, it might be that um, having a, a note taker in class could be something that would be really helpful. It might be uh, having audio versions of a textbook that could be something that would be done. That's going to be so unique to a student. And that's something that can be, um, some types of, of learning needs can be difficult to prepare for beforehand. But some of these just basic best practices will hopefully be helpful. Happy to visit about any specific questions later on. Please. Yeah, and I don't do as much with physical accessibility, but I, I could speak to that a little bit that every, um, as long as there's an accessible space in the classroom, that's usually what uh, the, target, the thing we work for in our classrooms here, and that would meet the kind of the ADA requirements there. Any other questions at all about accessibility? Any questions you have later on, or if this comes up in a classroom at any point, please, again, feel free to reach out to me, accessibility at usu.edu, or I'm just out there at a booth as well. Happy to talk about this stuff. Probably more than you want to listen, but happy to visit anytime. Thank you so much. <laughs>